Hey, everybody. Welcome. It's Nooner time. You are having a Nooner with me, Dave Lamont. Thank you very much for being part of this as I just adjust a couple of things here. Um, let's get right to it because you can follow me on Twitter at Dave Lamont one Instagram at Dave Lamont. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. All of the above are absolutely free. And I have got plenty to talk about today because <clears throat> if you are a Miami Dolphins fan, there is no wrong side of the bed for you. You're waking up with a team that is going to be in the playoffs. They could win the AFC East. They could finish with 11 wins, maybe more. Is every reason to feel optimistic. The Dolphins win yesterday. They are about to start a stretch of games, and they really started them yesterday, against some teams. San Diego, or excuse me, the LA Chargers being one of them. Uh, you've got... Five wins in the next three weeks, seven and four among the teams that you're playing. Broncos, Jets, who were the losingest of them all with a big fat nothing. And the Bengals, who at least are somewhat interesting with Joe Burrow, but they're not very good either. And they got waxed yesterday by the Stillers. The Dolphins are winning in every way imaginable. They won with great defense. They won by, you know, in other words, building a lead for a rookie quarterback's first start. They won where the quarter, rookie quarterback got into a duel with another great rookie quarterback, second-year quarterback in Kyler Murray, and performed well enough to win, led him to victory. And yesterday, while not at his super sharpest, and there were some questionable throws, again, defense and special teams and a good running game, that kind of balance. You know, you, there's the old line from an old NFL films. Of, it's about the Pittsburgh Steelers, I believe, of the 70s. And John Facenda in tone, great teams aren't always great. They're just great when they have to be. So are the Dolphins on the path to greatness? 100% yes. And it's really, it's okay to feel this way. I understand because the Dolphins have been, quite honestly, utterly irrelevant for years. And I mean years. Overlooked. You know, they pop up on an occasional Thursday night game, and those are always awful anyway. Maybe a Monday nighter, but they're going to be on Sunday night football probably twice this year. They have the Chiefs in a few weeks, which could be a highly entertaining game. And you have the game at the last weekend of the season in the first weekend in January against Buffalo, which could carry a 1,000 pounds of weight. And when was the last time the Dolphins played a regular season game like that? Because Buffalo lost yesterday, and the Bills are off today. The Dolphins take care of business against Denver, which, again, we expect them to. I'm sure they expect them to. Then you're tied. Now, yes, Buffalo has the advantage in the, in the play-in column, but you can do something about that. And who's to say that Buffalo's going to match you win for win down the stretch? Buffalo's schedule is a tiny bit tougher. They couldn't beat Arizona in Arizona. The Dolphins did. I don't know how far this is all going to go. Uh, you know, is this going to be, oh, my God, we're going to the Super Bowl? I don't know about that yet. But still, at, I mean, you got 11 wins here. The only, the only games that are toss-ups are the Patriots and Bills, the Raiders, who aren't that bad, and the Chiefs, who likely will win. I mean, you got to be honest about that. But unless you utterly screw up the next three, you're looking at, what, eight-game win streak? Eight? Yeah, eight. Nine and three and very well situated. It's an interesting year. Cleveland, although at the moment not eligible for the playoffs at six and three, is still six and three. The Browns are finally who we thought they were going to be like 10 years ago. And people kept thinking, oh, the Browns, this is their year. Well, hell, it might be. And the Patriots, it's been funny. I've read a couple of articles today about, you know, um, let's not count the Patriots out. I'm going to count them out. I don't think they have enough. Now, they're four and five. Look, one of those two wins in a row was the Jets. The other was a Baltimore team that is not as sharp offensively as they were last year. Lamar Jackson still one hell of a quarterback and one super dangerous weapon, but they can't get their running game straight. And let's face it, when the Ravens were the Ravens and they dominated the Dolphins a couple of times in the playoffs, they ran it down your gut and then beat you with defense. This group can't figure out who's going to be the running back. And although your quarterback might be your best runner, you cannot just continually subject him, even though he's a big guy, to getting the hell kicked out of him. So I'm not sure the Ravens are as sharp as they've been in the past. There are opportunities there. Yes, I know the Steelers finally woke up and killed the Bengals yesterday, but they've been shaky at times this year. They haven't lost, but 
Do you really think they're going to go through the rest of the season undefeated? Because I don't. There are some losses in their schedule. You know, I'm not trying to sell you a boatload of goods if I didn't have some belief in what I was trying to say. And I really believe that this team is set up for success, not just this year, but way down the road. This could be the beginning of a nice stretch of relevancy for Miami. Now, look, there's only one thing that can mess this up, and that's injuries. And that's the most unpredictable part of football. Something bad could happen to somebody, and and then you've got a real significant problem. But for those who have stuck around and and stayed uh, being fans, um, it's rewarding. You can wear your gear, put your uh, flags out. So it's an interesting time in the NFL with that. You have some teams that started hot. Seattle now looking a little shady. The NFC East is still a comedy show. I don't know who the best team in the NFC is. Is it the Saints? Is it the Bucks? I don't know. I mean, the Chiefs look like the team that could repeat for sure. It's wide open after that. Very interesting year. We shift to college. We. Let me look around. Yeah, it's just me. Side note, years ago, I worked with a guy in radio, WQAM, a name that's a call letter is going to come up later in the show. And he always said we when he meant me. What are you doing, buddy? Well, we're just going to go out, uh, grab something from Subway. Yeah, we're just going to go down and cover the uh, Doral Open. Yeah, we're just, and he just meant him. So I can't believe I said we when it's just me sitting here. And I, you know, I don't have any evidence of anybody here otherwise. Um, to answer real quickly a question here about how to pronounce the Dolphin player that looks like Ahmed, but they were calling him Ahmed, go with the guys who were paid to pronounce it. I'm sure they asked. And if they're wrong, they'll find out. But I'm going to go with, with the way the guys were paid to pronounce it. Uh, college football, Miami 7-1. and one. And if ever there was going to be a game where they were going to blow it in past fashion, it was Saturday. Fell behind. Uh, Virginia Tech's a, a good, not great, but a good team. There aren't, you know, the, the, the greatness in the ACC is still, and well, now Notre Dame this year, but Clemson is still the standard. Um, and they're winning. Now, this is another game coming up against Georgia Tech that a few years ago they would have gas piped it and lost. If they take care of business there, then they're on their way to a very nice season. And that's what you should be hoping for. Because with Miami, it is all about just winning, just taking care of the business that we waited you to take care for. I've talked about this every week after their games because, and I'm not going to ch- stop talking about it that way until they either blow one or until they finish the year with a nice record, which they appear to be on their way to do. So it's been a very good year. D.R. King has been a revelation. The new offense has been interesting, to say the least. I mean, one thing used to be terrible, calling the Hurricanes a boring team. That's not. But they were offensively, no question. Gators won as expected. Uh, they're going to just march right on to the SEC East Championship, and then we'll see how that all shakes out. Hey, at least they played. Half the SEC couldn't play. And then the most interesting story in college football is at Michigan and Penn State. And their inability to win. Penn State beaten by Nebraska. And Michigan losing again. Ohio State's going to beat them by 75. And now people are calling for the heads of the respective coaches, James Franklin and Jim Harbaugh. Now, both coaches have done well until this season. With Harbaugh, there is the incredible disappointment that he has not been able to beat Ohio State. And it's not going to happen this year. And people are now really suggesting that Michigan fire him, which I do not believe they're going to do. And don't take my word for it. There's a guy out there named John Bacon who covers Michigan sports, particularly football, as closely as Jim Harbaugh. And he says Michigan will not fire Harbaugh. It doesn't mean that he'll be around next season, but it won't come from the Michigan brass. Remember, when Harbaugh came to Michigan, this was the prodigal genius returning to home. This is the guy who took the same route Bo Schembechler took to drive to the office. 
This was the guy who was going to bring back Michigan football. And they've been good, but they haven't been great. And it is one of those programs like Army, Navy, uh, Auburn, Alabama, where your greatness is often defined by one game, and that ain't happening. With James Franklin, he walked into it. You know, Bill O'Brien has started to get that thing going, and then he bolted for the Texans, and then you know how that worked out. And Franklin comes in, having done something that I don't know if anybody will ever do again in this century, and it's 2020, win at Vanderbilt. And he bounced that into a gig at Penn State, and they've done well, but now they're horrible. It's a bizarre year in college football, where Indiana is a great Big Ten team this year. Uh, Wisconsin can't finish half their, half their games, but they did destroy Michigan. So anything is liable to happen. I don't know if I fire James Franklin either. We love to overreact. And in the sports media, we're right there driving the overreaction bus because I think the writers are thinking, well, this is what the fans want to hear. They want to hear that James Franklin's on the hot seat. They want to hear that Michigan's going to get rid of Harbaugh. So I'm going to write it. And talk shows, forget about it. You know where that's going. But it's a fascinating little battle here to see what really does happen in the offseason. I wouldn't be shocked if Harbaugh bails and leaves that job open. And with Franklin, I don't know. You know, Penn State, still with some people, is, is scarred by what happened years ago. And no matter who you put in there as a coach, it's not going to matter. They're going to hate Penn State forever. Others have gone, well, everybody is either dead or fired or in jail. And it's okay. You know, the people who were there had nothing to do with what happened. So I'm willing to give them an opportunity to, to prove that Penn State can be a good place to play football and to support, which is kind of how I feel about it. So what happened there? I don't know. How do you not have the talent? How does Michigan not ever get a great quarterback when the guy who's coaching you was a quarterback in the NFL for years and a pretty good one? Not a great one, but a pretty good one. I don't know. So that's a, in some ways, their failures are as interesting. And I don't get any joy out of it. So, you know, I get no joy out of it at all. But their failures are sometimes as interesting as successes. We expect Alabama to be great. We expect Clemson to be great. We, some of these things are happening, we expect. Then you get an unexpected team like Indiana, for example. And then you get the opposite of that. And it's interesting. It is driving on the turnpike past the car wreck on the other side of the highway. That's what's happening right now from a college football perspective. It's happening in Columbia, South Carolina, where Will Muschamp was not surprisingly let go. And it had nothing to do with his behavior on the sidelines, so that doesn't always help. But they're just not good. And I've been to that place, and they've got what they need to win. Facilities, support, all that stuff is there. Head ball coach helped with that when he was there. They have not been able to replace him since. Muschamp did have one really good year, but that was it. And I already have a guy for you. So... And again, I have no ties to South Carolina emotionally, physically. There's nobody in my family who's ever gone there. I don't even know if I know anybody who's a friend who's been to the University of South Carolina. But I'm going to tell you now, and they may have already done this, and this is who I'm calling for my job, the guy at Louisiana, Billy Napier. And Louisiana is good, brother. They are good. And he has built up. By the way, this is a, a Nick Saban guy who could have had a lot of jobs, who could not a lot, let me rephrase that, who could have had some jobs last year outside of Lafayette, Louisiana, but chose to stay. I don't think he's going to be there after this year. Somebody's going to tempt him. And I think the South is an area where he is more comfortable. And I think South Carolina is perfect for this guy. Billy Napier. Look him up if you don't know him. Take my word for you. And you're going to hear a ton of other names. The two Clemson coordinators are going to come in. But I'm telling you, Billy Napier is your guy. So if you are a Gamecock out there, you're welcome. 
I'm happy to help. I feel like it's, you know, if I have this kind of information, what good am I doing sitting on it? So there's your guy. As far as anything else, I got nothing. Uh, you had the weirdness yet of a college game yesterday, UCLA clock and Cal. There was a game that was postponed. Actually, a game that was literally made up. It's like your your pickleball partners cancel on you, so you found two other people or three other people to play pickleball with, and you just hastily arrange a game. That's what happened. And, you know, hilariously they played. It wasn't too funny for Cal, but Chip Kelly needs all the help he can get right now, so he'll take it. It's a mess. The MAC already had to cancel a game. The Mountain West is in trouble with a couple of teams. Uh, the Pac-12 has had some problems. Everybody's had problems. And it's just going to be this way. There's talk of moving the championships. And this might not be a bad idea. And there's talk of moving college basketball. Rick Pitino's idea. And you think, well, I don't know about that, Rick. Everybody's kind of on the path, and you find out Tom Izzo at Michigan State tested positive. Uh, I know there's been some positive tests around the country, players. So, I don't know about May Madness, but there's going to be college basketball cancellations. There's going to be issues. Just prepare for it. And while we hear potential good news about a vaccine down the road, right now we're not hearing very much good news about the rise in cases and even the rise in the death rate. So I, we happen to know somebody, I won't mention this person's name, who is coming out of a nearly two-week stay in intensive care. And this is not some person that you would consider to put in an at-risk category. Uh, but it's, you know, it's pretty serious. So it's going to be an interesting and weird college basketball year as just as this interesting and weird college football year is and a weird year in golf because we finally finished the masters seven months later than normal. And the result may not have made any difference when you played it because the best golfer in the world won, took care of business, couple of shaky moments early in the round on Sunday. But at the end, Dustin Johnson walked away with his first green jacket, which I knew was his first green jacket, but at the same time, it still surprised the hell out of me because he's so good. He's just insanely talented. And as Ray Boone, my, uh, our pro friend, mentioned in one of my master's previews, that Justin Johnson doesn't overthink his role on the golf course. It doesn't mean he doesn't strategize, he doesn't prepare, all this other stuff, but he doesn't overthink it. And when you can hit it like he can, you don't have to think. You just walk up and hit it. And he is so gifted. So a very deserving master's winner. Yes, it was bizarre. When I watched on Thursday and Friday on a uh, computer screen, on, on streaming services, it really threw me off. There were holes I didn't recognize. And I've watched the Masters since I was a kid. There are holes I didn't recognize because there weren't people there. And I remember talking to my buddy on the phone. I go, well, he hit it somewhere, but I don't really know what to tell you because there's usually people standing there. So it was, it was dull in that respect. There's only so much you can do in a telecast, no matter how good your announcers are, or how sharp your production people are, or how great your producer and director are, if you don't have an, the, the honest ambiance of real people. So we can only hope that April of 2021, we get back to a normal golf schedule and then we have a normal Masters with 40,000 people there. How bizarre was it that Tiger Woods walks up, you know, as the defending champion in 18, normally we get a very polite round of applause or bigger. It's like, you know, his girlfriend is there, a couple of the people he knows, his agent, I think, were on the course, and that was it. Speaking of Tiger, there's an interesting, there's an interesting debate about his round and his role in this Masters. And look, he was way out of it. He finished 19 shots behind, okay? And he took a, a ridiculous 10 on the difficult par 3, 12, which I think is the greatest hole in golf outside the road hole at St. Andrews. And I'm deadly serious, by the way, about that hole. I, and, it, and it's such a compact area. There is more trouble there than I can think of in any other hole. And sure enough, he blows one in the water, makes a lousy third shot, knocks two, two more balls in the water, including one from an angle that I would have probably picked it up and taking it out of the bunker, excuse me. 
And he goes from uh, three under to four over and then finished one under. He birdied five of the last six holes. And not only did he birdie him, he kicked the hell out of him. I think his longest putt was his last one in 18, and he just drained that like it was nothing. I realize there's no pressure at that point. His tournament is over, but that's just my point. He could have just as easily said, you know what? Screw this. I'm just going to slap it around the golf course, and whatever happens, happens. That's not who he is. And that's why one of the reasons I like the guy, one of the reasons I rooted for Michael Jordan, and it's one of the reasons I like Tom Brady. Sorry. Because it matters. Every possession, every pass, every swing matters. They know who they are. They know what they've done. And they know what's expected of them. And they expect more than you or I do. And the way he finished that to me was remarkable. It was kind of thrilling. And there's the people who were going to say, look, who gives a crap? Because it had zero impact on the outcome of the Masters. And you're absolutely right. But it just showed you what the mentality is for guys like that. And that was impressive. And in order to do that, of course, Tiger had to hit a lot of good golf shots, didn't he? Yeah, I had kind of gotten away from fixing the English language, which was one of my objectives when I started the show back in the summer. But I got to I got to do this especially to you broadcasters out there who watch or younger broadcasters or just people in general. When you are playing golf, whether you play it at the level of Dustin Johnson or my level or even worse, what are you doing? You're hitting golf shots. It's given. So why would anyone on network television ever say, that, uh, that was a good golf shot. What other kind of shot is it? Period. It's one of the most unnecessary phrases in sports casting, and it made me just, ah, oh, I groaned when I heard that. But that's okay, because how many times have we all heard, well, you know, he did a great job scoring the basketball there. What else is there to score? Exactly. You don't. Let me ask you this. You watch football from, say, what, Tuesday night through Sunday, and if you throw in tonight's game, the Bears and the Vikings, do you think any announcer has said, you know, that was a good football pass? That was a great football block. No, not if they want to keep working. I have haven't watched as much tennis lately as I used to, but I think it's not bloody likely that too often has anybody said, great tennis shot. Great shot. Yeah. Great baseball pitch. No. Didn't hear about that. You know, when the, Tom Seaver and Bob Gibson passed away, we didn't hear about great baseball pitchers. They were pitchers. Guy hits a home run. Is that a great baseball home run? Yep. It's a home run. So when somebody hits a nice shot, in golf, on a golf course, with a golf club, using a golf ball, you do not have to tell me it is a golf shot. I'm down with that. I know. So let's work on that. Let's just eliminate that from the vocab immediately. Throw it away. All right? We don't need that. Hey, I just watched the Panthers game. Yeah, boy, those guys are nice hockey skaters. No! They're not. They're skaters. We good? All right. Last thing, and a bit of a sad note, but I saw this this morning. Uh, Bob McKay, if you know South Florida radio at all, and this is kind of an inside baseball dealio, but I, I feel like I need to say something here. Bob McKay passed away uh, over the weekend. Bob was at WQAM when I was there, and it was transitioning out of AM and into FM radio to Kiss Country, which is in the same building owned by the same company. And at the time that Bob was transitioning into FM radio, uh, country music was exploding and country radio was becoming very big. And Bob was right in the middle of all of that. And Kiss had some great people. Bob was on the air. They had the unbelievable smile of Jack Daniels. I don't know where that guy is, if he's still alive, but I have stories. Whew, I don't know how that guy was alive. I don't. Darlene Evans, uh, Lisa LaPerry. 
you know, people that uh, I got to know a little bit with them being in the same building when that station was a monster. And I do not know radio ratings now in, in my area at all. I don't cover it. I'm not working for a radio show or radio station. So I just, I hate to say it, but I don't really pay attention. But um, I do know that KISS was doing very, very well, and Bob had a lot to do with that. To show you how much of a child I am, Bob on the air uh, did commercials. He was starting to have thinning hair. And I remember him doing a commercial, and he would talk about whatever product it was, and I can't remember the name of the product. And he would always go, and it makes my hair thicker, fuller. And for years... My friends and I, whenever Bob's name would come up, we'd go, oh, yeah, thicker, fuller. Uh, but Bob was also a decent man and not an overbearing type of manager. I think he understood talent because he was talent um, and really was not a difficult guy to get along with. I've been fortunate in my radio career that I could probably list the people that I really disliked as management on this hand and, and still have some other fingers left. I've been lucky. I've worked for some really, really good people. Um, and Bob would be on that list. So to Bob's friends and family and my condolences, it was a, a guy who I think his heart was in the right place. And you can't always say that about people in management in this business sometimes. Uh, but you absolutely can say that about Bob McKay. So, you know, my thoughts would be with Bob and his friends and family today. That'll wrap it up for today's Nooner. I am Dave Lamont. Don't forget to do all of those things and please help improve my YouTube numbers. I mean, there are nine-year-olds who have like 25 times more subscribers than I do. So I appreciate you guys very much. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again.